Amen. Um, welcome all the mothers and welcome all of you to Bethany for Mother's Day service. And real quick before we start, there was a phone lost in the uh, coffee bar. And so if you're missing your phone, go there and get it after the service. And then I'll call you. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I do uh, really love Mother's Day because it's a day that goes... Uh, should be 364 days out of the year <laughs> because uh, mothers are so important to each and every one of us. And uh, I think about the passage where Mary was first presented the opportunity that she was going to be the mother of Jesus by the angel. He said, hail favored one. And I hope all the mothers out there feel like they're favored today. And uh, We do honor you and thank you for being the uh, strength of most families, if not all families. So let's go ahead and close, open uh, our service with prayer and bow with me if you will. Our gracious Father, we do thank you for the day where we can honor and uh, bring attention to mothers and how important they are to our families and to uh, our church families too. And we just thank you for that. We thank you for the gift of uh, being within your church to be uh, here able to worship you. fellowship with one another, to learn from your word and to sing praises to you. We ask now that you would receive our praise with uh, our humility, with our uh, dependence on you, with our throwing ourselves at your feet and uh, wanting to just serve you, to live our lives for you. We just thank you for the blessing of salvation. Thank you for giving us your son. It's in his name we pray. Good morning. Welcome, church family. Let's stand and sing and praise the Lord this morning.
Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so very much for your goodness in our lives. And we thank you so very much that your name is worthy to be praised and honored and worshipped, revered, uh, to be set apart, Lord, that you are above all things because you are the maker of all things. It only makes sense why we would honor you and worship you because none of us, no matter how much we want to be the maker of our own destiny or the maker of our own way or the maker of our own things, Lord, none of us has created any of us, that we all depended upon you. And so that is why we worship you. That's why we seek after you. That's why we, we desire you. That's why we crave being in your presence. And this morning, Father, I pray that no matter where we are coming from, whether we are coming from a place of absolute devotion and worship and faithfulness and just excited to be able to worship you and be in your presence, uh, even to those that are here this morning with a lot of questions, burdens, doubts, fears, worries, that you welcome both the sinner, the saint. You welcome those that are far from you and those that are near to you, Lord, that you welcome all of us into your presence because it was never by any of our work, never by anything that we've ever done that, that ushered us into that presence to begin with. We are welcomed into your presence because of the work of your son, Jesus. And so for that, we say thank you. And that is why we want to worship you and honor you. And that's why we want to grow deeper in knowing who you are. And I pray that you would open our eyes this morning. Where there are things that are distracting us. There are things that have our attention. God, I pray that for just a moment, we might be able to put those aside. So that we might hear that which you have for us. And that we might be able to hear the voice of your Holy Spirit in our lives this morning. God, we love you. We praise you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, before we hop into the sermon today, it is a special day. If you didn't already know, gentlemen, <laughs> kids, today is Mother's Day. And uh, we wanted to take a moment to recognize all the moms that are out there today because as has been shared earlier already, uh, first in song with our choir and they're singing uh, the beautiful song talking about a mother's love, uh, also uh, shared in, in our time of prayer that mothers are a blessing from the Lord. Moms wear a lot of hats in the family. Moms are oftentimes the, reticle, the, the, the resident medical professional of the house. They're the resident counselor that whenever kids have woes and fears and worries, who do they tend to run to first? Mom. They're oftentimes the teachers and the tutors. They're the nurturers. Many times they're their, their child's first confidant. Moms hold a special place in the family and they tend to be the very glue of the family. But at the same time, as special as today is, it can also be a very emotional day for many. As a matter of fact, while countless moms look forward to going to church with their kids or grandkids on Mother's Day, it also happens to be the day of the year with the most absences by women who intentionally decide not to come to church that day because even though they want to celebrate motherhood with dear friends, it can be a very difficult day for them. Because for some, like me, they may have lost their mother. For some, it's a difficult day because they may have grown up with an absentee mom. For some, it may be hard because they've longed to be a mother and to have children of their own, but were unable to do so. For some, it's difficult because they may have lost children along the way. Or for some, it's a difficult day because they're separated from their children or grandchildren for one reason or another. And so for those of you that are hurting or grieving today, we want you to know that we see you. And we want you to know, more importantly, that God sees you and God loves you deeply. At the same time, we believe that it's possible for us to honor and care for you while also celebrating Mother's Day. Because as we said, Mother's Day... And moms, really, they're a gift from the Lord. They're a gift to us. And so for all the women that are present today, we want to honor you and thank you, whether you're a mother, you're an adopted mom, you're a stepmom, 
a foster mom. You have dreams of one day being a mom. You're a mom-to-be. You're a mom at heart. That perhaps you stood in the gap for children who didn't have a mother present in their life. Or maybe you're a spiritual mom. We've had many of those in our church, women who have stood in the gap and loved and ministered to children growing up in the church and ministered to them as if they were their own children and helping those kids grow in their faith. My, my three children, uh, their faith, if you ask them the testimony of their story, it's not just my name and Laura's name that they'll share with you, but there are countless uh, women in the church that have loved on them, poured into them, invested in them, have discipled them, and so we have a lot of spiritual moms that are present as well. And we want you to know, all of you, that we are grateful for each and every one of you. And so thanks to our women's ministry, at the conclusion of our service, we're going to be, we're going to be passing out little succulent plants for each of you. All the different women that I just named, we have a succulent for you. And if by chance we happen to have any extra at the end, kids, you're welcome to grab those and take them to maybe some other special women that are in your life, like grandmas or aunts or maybe there's a special neighbor uh, or a special uh, woman in your life who may not be mom but has cared for you and loved you all the same also this past week we had a drawing uh, it was available through email and also on our social media accounts and uh, the drawing uh, was for a $40 gift card to Texas Roadhouse and we're giving away two of those gift cards the drawing happened last night and the winners of the Mother's Day drawing are, get your drum roll, <laughs> are uh, Ruth Hodge and Carol Ray. And so if you are present, when you go to get your succulent, also grab your gift card on the way out. And so Chuck, we're going to be checking ID, so don't try anything. <laughs> so moms we want to honor you we love you we're so grateful for you and listen never underestimate the role you play in the faith lives of your children never underestimate the prayers that you pray as a mother there are many people sitting in this sanctuary that are sitting here in this room right now because of the prayers of their mother and their grandmother in the life of Timothy, we often hear about Paul's role in discipling and mentoring Timothy. We hear a lot about Paul and Timothy in terms of, you know, Paul's influence and how he discipled and led Timothy to be the pastor and the man that he is. But if you were to ask Paul, who's responsible for the faith of Timothy and the growth of Timothy, what he would tell you is that Timothy's faith actually comes from much earlier in his life. Matter of fact, matter of fact he wrote about that. In his second letter to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, he tells, he tells Timothy this, writing a personal letter to Timothy. He says, Timothy, I recall your sincere faith that first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I am convinced is in you also. It all started with a mom. It all started with a grandma. Two women of faith who prayed, who taught, who trained, and then, by the way, released Timothy, right? Because how easy is it to want to hold on to our children and say, please don't go too far away from me. But had she done that, Ephesus would have been without a pastor. Cities would have been without an evangelist. Countless people would have been without a preacher. But they trusted the Lord enough to say, God, you have given me my son. And to him, I also entrust him to you. And wherever you want to lead, let him go. Moms, never underestimate your calling and your role in your children's and grandchildren's lives. Never underestimate the words that you share, the prayers that you pray, and the model of faith that you demonstrate for them. And so if you are present with us and you're one of the mothers that's in the room, if you would, please stand for a moment, if you would. And remain standing, by the way. If you would stand, all the moms that are present, please stand. And the reason I want you to stay standing is because we want to pray for you. And instead of me praying, uh, I have asked one of our teenagers if they would be willing to actually come 
and pray for the moms. And I've asked Cole McReynolds if he would do that. So, Cole, if you want to come on up and grab one of these mics. All right, and let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we would like to take this time on this morning, on Mother's Day, Lord, to show our appreciation to all of the mothers, grandmothers, aunts, and motherly figures. These women are courageous and hardworking working, and put their needs and wants to the side to raise their children, Lord. This comes with many hardships and struggles, but these women do it with smiles and loving hearts. This is what true sacrificial love looks like, and we should all strive to be like these excellent models of faith, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can have a seat. I couldn't have done that better, man. Well done. Well, today we're starting a brand new series. For the last 22 weeks, we have been looking at a series on doctrine, right? So almost six months, we've been diving through the doctrine, the truths uh, that matter to the life of a Christian. Today, we're going to start a brand new series, sort of a brand new series. We're actually bringing back a popular series from last year, and we're going to add on to it. And we're going to do a three-part mini-series Some of you may remember this series from last year. It's called Stranger Than Fiction. And so we're going to bring it back, and we're doing more Stranger Than Fiction uh, for the next couple of weeks. But what this series does is it's looking at some of the crazy, oddest, funniest, strangest stories in the Bible. And as strange as these accounts might be, they are totally true. And they teach us truths, like deep truths about who God is about what worship looks like, and what life with Jesus looks like. Most of these are going to seem like little snippets or kind of innocuous passages uh, that maybe you've read before, or maybe this is going to be the first time that you've read them. But if you've read them before, you've likely read it and said, man, what an odd story. And then you just kind of keep going. Or you've read that and you said, wait a minute, what did that just say? And you go back and you reread it two or three times, and you're still not really sure what that meant. And then you start to wonder, why don't we ever talk about that in church, right? Or you read it and you go, I'm not really sure what that was about, but you're not really sure what to do with it either, so you just kind of move along. And so we did this series last year. We looked at a lot of different unique passages. Some of my favorites already we've covered, but last year we looked, and you'll remember some of these, Jesus and the Sons of Thunder. We talked about Balaam and his talking donkey, Paul preaching, the guy falling asleep, falling out of, a, out of a window, hitting the ground, dying. Paul brought him back to life and said, back to church. And he kept preaching, right? We read about the false god Dagon and the ark of God. And my favorite one, Elijah and the she-bears, okay? And so we have a few more curious stories and interesting stories in this three-part. Today, we're going to look at a passage that's sort of a blend of odd, terrifying, but also eye-opening. It's in Numbers chapter 11. If you have your Bibles in person, you're welcome, or, or in person or Bible and app, you're welcome to turn there. If you don't, we'll have it on the screen for you. We're going to read Numbers chapter 11, and we're going to kind of break this chapter apart. So we're going to do what I call chunking it apart. We're going to read in little sections at a clip as we're going. But all throughout history, this is looking at Israel. They're wandering in the desert. Israel has this record of sounding like a bunch of children. All right, especially when they're journeying through the wilderness for 40 years, right? They start to sound like kids in the backseat of a car on a long road trip. You know, on that road trip, and kids will say, well, how long till we get there, right? That's Israel. He's touching me. I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. And so you as the parents say, fine, here you go. And you give them something to eat, and they go, I don't want that, right? That's Numbers 11, That's exactly what happens in Numbers 11. They're two years, they're a little over two years now wandering in the desert, in the wilderness. God has provided them food. He's provided them manna, right? They didn't have to work for it. Free bread. All they had to do was go gather up the bread each day that fell with the dew. They just had to gather it up, prepare it, and eat it. The day before the Sabbath, they had, to, they had to gather twice as much, prepare twice as much, so that on the Sabbath, all they had to wake up and do was rest in the Lord and eat. They didn't even have to work for it that day. But it wasn't enough. 
And some of the Israelites began to complain. And that's where we pick up Numbers 11. We're going to start with verses 4 through 9. Let's read together. It says, the riffraff. In other words, the whiners or the complainers. Now, some of, this, some of these may be actually foreign people who traveled with Israel out of Egypt. Okay? But it says, the riffraff among them had a strong craving for other food. The Israelites wept again and said, who will feed us meat? We remember the free fish that we ate in Egypt, along with the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our appetite's gone. There's nothing for us to look at but this manna. The manna resembled coriander seed, and its appearance was like that of delium. And the people walked around and they gathered it, and they ground it on a pair of grounding stones or crushed it in a mortar. And then they boiled it in a cooking pot and shaped it into cakes. And it tasted like a pastry cooked with the finest oils. And when the dew fell on the camp at night, the manna would fall with it. Let's stop there. All right, so the riffraff, in other words, the whiners of Israel. There's always got to be some. Right? They start to complain. They start to whine. They get bread, but it's not enough. Right? They want meat. They're like, we need the substance. And some of us are like, amen, we can relate to that. Get us a good steak. But on this journey, God is providing for them everything that they need, but it's not enough. So they start crying, literally weeping, right? So they're not just like shedding a tear. It says they're literally weeping. They're boo-hooing. They're having pity parties all over the camp. And they start, not only that, not only crying because they're like, I just want a steak. I just want a ribeye. But they're crying because they're like, man, don't you remember our days in Egypt when we were slaves? Those were the days. We had so much better food. And their complaints aren't just that they don't have meat. What they're really doing is they're accusing God of being a bad provider. And so they start to lay it on thick. And they don't just do it once. They do it day in and day out. Day in and day out. So that starts to bring new complaints to the camp. This time with Moses. Let's read about those. Continuing on, verses 10 through 15. It says, so Moses heard the people, family after family, weeping at the entrance of their tent. So they're not even in the tent crying. They're at the door making sure the whole city can hear them. Right? The Lord was angry. Moses now is also provoked. Verse 11, it says, so Moses asked the Lord, why have you brought such trouble on your servant? Why are you angry with me? And why do you burden me with all these people? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth so that you should tell me, carry them at your breast as a nursing mother carries a baby, Moses, to the land that you swore to give to their ancestors? Where can I get meat even to feed all of these people? For their weeping, give us meat. But I can't carry these people by myself. They're too much for me. If you're going to treat me like this, God, then please kill me right now. If I have found favor with you, don't even let me see my misery anymore. Okay? Parents, you know those long, windy road trips. It doesn't matter where you're going. You don't have to be running errands. You could be heading to Disney. You could be heading on a family vacation. It does not matter where you're going, but in the back, all you hear are complaints from those in the back, and you start to wonder why you ever thought this was a good idea. <laughs> There's even a part of you about halfway through the trip where you start to contemplate and wonder if jumping out of the car is really as bad as it seems. Kids, it is, but I'm just saying. Then you know how Moses is feeling right about now in the desert, and by the way, they're only two years in. This is a 40-year journey. <laughs> and so Moses says, what did I do to deserve this kind of punishment? So he gets mad with God. He's like, God, what did I do to deserve this? Why are you punishing me? And besides that, even if I'm going to give them meat, let's be honest, we have some flocks with us, but not that many animals, right? Where are we going to get enough meat to take care of all these people? Not only that, even if we get everybody a steak, let's be honest, they're going to wake up tomorrow and what are they going to want? Another steak. And then guess what we don't have? All our flocks are gone. Everything's gone. So we've got nothing. 
There's not enough food on this planet, God, to satisfy these people. So Moses says, God, I have a better idea. Just kill me now. (laughs) I'd rather die than suffer like this for 38 more years. As a good provider and a good God, God answers prayers. Know that. And God answers our complaints. For Moses, praise God, he didn't answer his prayer. God didn't answer Moses' prayer, and in history we record this would be a good decision by the Lord. Keep that in mind. Sometimes the prayers that God doesn't answer, it kind of turns out he knows what he's doing. But God doesn't answer Moses' prayer. Instead, he helps him. Let's look at verse 16 and 17. It says, the Lord answered Moses. He said, bring me. 70 men from Israel, known to you as elders and officers of the people. Take them to the tent of meeting and have them stand there with you. Then I'll come down and I'll speak with you there. I will take some of the spirit who is on you and put the spirit on them. They will help you bear the burden of the people so that you do not have to bear it by yourself. Right? This is such a loving response by God, isn't it? Moses was not very gracious in his time of prayer. He was not very gracious in crying out to God. But you know the thing about God is this. God gives Moses and God gives us space to be human. He gives him space not to be okay. That when he enters God's presence, he's allowed to just be Moses. God doesn't hold Moses accountable for being vulnerable. Matter of fact, in the book of Psalms, I've talked about this numerous times before. But in the book of Psalms, there's 150 Psalms. Over half of the book of Psalms are not Psalms of praise, but Psalms of lament. It's people crying out to God who are saying, I'm not okay. When Moses goes before God and he's praying and he's upset and he's saying, God, just kill me. What he's really saying between the lines of anger is I'm not okay. I'm not happy with where things are. I'm suffering. I'm miserable. Countless heroes in the Bible have prayed prayers that start with how long, O Lord, is this going to continue? Why, God? Please hear me, God. Please don't stay silent from me, God. And so Moses cries out and said some very vulnerable things because he was in a very vulnerable place. But God heard him. And so what God tells him to do is to gather together 70 elders to help him handle the complaints of the people, right? In other words, he gets to form a complaints department. I'm not sure what they do with the complaints. My guess is they come in, they complain, and they say, okay, suck it up and send them on their way. We're not really sure. But what we know now is Moses doesn't have to be the one to handle it. But it's not just that. God takes this a step further. Not only does he say call 70 men, but he also tells them that these 70 men, God is going to take the Holy Spirit that is on him and that he is going to take the Holy Spirit and put it on these 70 elders. That he's going to empower these elders with the power of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. So real quick sidebar, we just got done talking about doctrine. We talked a lot about the person, the nature of the Trinity, and the nature of the of the Holy Spirit. And one of the questions that we talked about is Is the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? Numbers eleven? Yes, he is. The Holy Spirit was with Moses, and God used the Holy Spirit in the life of these seventy elders. Let me tell you why this is so special. Because not only does it empower them, but it also means That when the people come to the complaint department, the 70 elders, and they're complaining to these elders that have the Holy Spirit, that means God himself is going to take an active part in hearing the cries of the people. That the Holy Spirit himself will bear witness to the cries and the longings of the people. And the reason he does this is because he's a loving, caring, gracious God, and he sees his servant Moses hurting and in verse 17, he says, I'm going to do this so that you, don't have to ter- that you don't have to carry this all by yourself. 
It's just like Jesus in the New Testament where he said that we can cast our cares, our worries upon him because his yoke is light. That he cares deeply about the things that we're going through and the hurts that we're experiencing. God cares about those things. So God answers Moses' complaint. And then he answers Israel's complaint. And his response is not what you'd expect. Or maybe it is. Let's see. We're going to keep reading verse 18 through 20. So God says, tell the people, consecrate yourselves, like clean yourselves, get ready, in readiness for tomorrow, and you're going to eat meat because you wept in the Lord's hearing who is going to feed us meat. We were better off in Egypt. So the Lord is going to give you meat, and you're going to eat, and you will eat, not for one day, not for two days, or five days, or ten days, or twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes nauseating to you. Because you have rejected the Lord who is among you, you wept before him. Why did we ever leave Egypt? Pause there for a moment. God says, oh, you want meat, do you? You can have meat. You liked life better when you were with your oppressors in Egypt? You remember when you were crying out to me saying, God, free us, free us, free us? And now that you're free, you're looking backwards and you're going, man, where's the meat? They were better. They took care of us. They loved us. God doesn't love us. So God says, fine, you want meat? It's going to be coming out of your nose. You're going to eat so much meat, you're going to puke. Right? That's kind of a strong response. You think you're full leaving a Brazilian steakhouse. God says, just wait. And when God gave them the manna, the thing you have to remember is when God gave them manna, not only was it sweet to the taste, like it was made with all the finest oils, but it satisfied them. It's exactly what they needed. They walked away full and happy. But what God tells him now, he said, you weren't happy being happy. You weren't happy being satisfied. So now you're going to be so full of meat, you're going to wish you were vegetarians. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever eaten so much that the second you did it, you instantly regretted it? Some of y'all are going, yep, every time I go to Parker's. (laughs) When I was about 10 years old, my family went to this all-you-can-eat restaurant. I think it was like Sizzler or something. They had the, the all-you-can-eat ice cream bar at the end. We couldn't wait for that part. And so I stand up. I said, I'm all done eating, Dad. Can I get ice cream? And he says, sure, go ahead. And I said, awesome. So I start walking. He goes, wait a minute. Come back here, Chris. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, hey, whatever you get, you're going to eat. I said, yes, sir, not a problem. And, he, and I started to walk. He says, no, 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 come back here. And I said, yes, sir. He said, whatever you get, you're going to eat. I said, Yes, sir, not a problem. No salute. I would have gotten in trouble. So I was like, yes, sir. <laughs> All right. And so I, I turn and I walk to go get the ice cream. And for whatever reason, these places always put this tiny little shallow dish next to the ice cream. It's almost like they know what kids are going to do. So they put this tiny little saucer that barely holds anything. And so I engineered myself a better idea. I said, I know where better bowls are. And I went to the soup bar and I got me a soup bowl. And I brought the soup bowl over, and I loaded the thing full of ice cream and every topping with the exception of peanuts. And I loaded that thing all the way up. I mean, this thing was overflowing. And I go to sit down, and my dad said, son, I said, I already know, dad, it's going to be glorious. (laughs) And so I start to eat. I take four, five, six bites. I don't remember how many, but I remember I hit the magic line. And all of a sudden, my body said, you cannot handle anything else sweet. And my body also said, we cannot put this anywhere else. And so I said, pushed the bowl away, and I said, I'm done. And my dad looked at me. He took my bowl, and he went, no, you're not. And I said, Dad, I can't eat another bite. He said, we're not leaving till you do. Let me tell you something. It wasn't just me that was miserable. My whole family was miserable because we sat there for 45 minutes while I ate the rest of that ice cream. That's not even a lie. I got home. I was not a Christian at this point. I'm not even really sure where my faith in Christ was at this point. Didn't go to church. 
a great deal. But I'll tell you where, where I found myself that night was praying. And I literally prayed and I said, God, I will never eat ice cream again as long as I live. Please just make the pain stop. That's not true, though, because I did eat ice cream last night. But that aside, that moment is Israel in Numbers chapter 11. See, something that Moses knew, but many in Israel forgot, is that God is a good provider. He gives us everything that we need, oftentimes before we ever ask for it. But it's not always what we want. I'm going to say that again. God is a good provider, oftentimes giving us everything that we need, but not always what we want. He doesn't always answer our impulses, our whims, or our desires, because a lot of times our impulses, our desires, are short-sighted and self-centered. Just look at what Moses asked for. He said, kill me now. He had no concept of two weeks from now. He had no concept of two generations from now. He had no vision that one day Bethany Baptist Church would be sitting here reading his story and how God worked in and through the testimony of his life. He had no vision of how God could or would use him. All he could see was right in front of him and death was better. Our whims, our desires are so short-sighted and self-centered Israel was whining about the food that God provided, all the while forgetting, right? They're in one moment, but they're forgetting what the future already holds for them, the promise that's already been given, that they're, the reason they're in the wilderness is to move to a new home, a new place, a place that's called the land flowing with milk and honey. It's in the name that they're going to a place that's going to be so much better than where they're at. And they can't see it because all they can see is their current station. All they can see is today. We get short-sighted in our days. We get short-sighted in our moments. And we make irrational decisions or rash decisions in a moment because we think if we don't do this, this stuff is never going to end. And we don't for a second stop and go, God, what are you doing in the midst of this? How are you wanting to use this moment? Even more important than the fact fact that Israel forgot that they're going to a land flowing with milk and honey, they completely forgot that they're not alone, that God was actually present with them, that he was actually in the camp, that they had, I mean, it was literally called the tent of meeting. It It was the tabernacle. And every time Israel set up camp, it was set at the center of the camp. And God would meet with them. He meets with them in Numbers 11. But they can't see that. All they can see is their current station. And so what they're, what they're complaining reveals is that the people didn't really want God. They just wanted the desires of their hearts, no matter what it costs. They just wanted the desire of their heart, no matter what it would cost them. Anybody that was willing to help Israel was good in their book. Right? They would say, you know what? These people that are helping us, they really care about us. Anybody that wasn't giving them what they wanted would accuse them of not loving them like they were doing God. God wasn't giving them what they wanted. He was giving them what they needed. And even though he had given them bread that was sweet and desirable, and even though he was with them in the desert, it wasn't enough. They accused God of being unloving and unselfish, or excuse me, unloving and selfish. And compared him instead to their slave masters in Egypt, who they now think are kind and gracious and loving. They're like, man, that guy that was beating me, he sure was great. I mean, yeah, the days were rough, but night, we could throw down and eat. Since they didn't really want God, God allowed the desires of their heart to be carried to its logical conclusion. Think about this. Some of the times that we pray in the most desperate places we find ourselves, look backwards at some of the prayers that you prayed and how God did not answer the thing you were asking for the way you were asking for it, and that was good. What would have happened if God would have said, sure, let me do that for you? 
Where would you be right now? God, because Israel doesn't stop, that's just how they roll. Like a five-year-old asking questions, it doesn't stop until there's an answer. And so they just keep saying, why, why, why? So God allows them to allow their accusation to be carried out to its logical conclusion. Let's skip ahead in Numbers to verse 31 through 35, and let's see how this thing wraps up. It says, the wind sent by the Lord came up and blew quail, right, little birds, from the sea. It dropped them all around the camp. They were flying three feet off the ground for about a day's journey in every direction. In other words, they were everywhere. The people were up all that day and night and all the next day gathering the quail. The one who took the least amount of quail gathered 60 bushels the least and then they spread them all they spread them out all around the camp verse 33 it says while the meat was still between their teeth before it was even chewed the lord's anger burned against the people and the lord struck them with a very severe plague and so they named that place kibroth hatava which, by the way, translates to the graves of craving or the graves of gluttony or the graves of lust because there they buried the people who had craved the meat. And from Kibroth Hatava, the people moved on to Hezeroth and they remained there. God gave the people exactly what they wanted and it was the death of them. God gave them everything before this. And it was just never enough for them. God had freed them from slavery in Egypt. Wasn't enough. God had promised them a new home flowing with milk and honey. It wasn't enough. God had promised them that he would give them bread every day and provide for their needs. Right? And that bread would satisfy them. It wasn't enough. By the way, when we pray those prayers before our meals, some of you pray the you know, that Lord, and give us, give us, Lord, our daily bread, right? And that's also within the Lord's prayer, right? This comes from the fact that God provided daily bread for the people, that God provides daily for our needs. But God gave them bread every single day to the point that they were full and satisfied, exactly what they needed. No measuring cups. It was to the portion what they needed. They were satisfied, but it wasn't enough. God was present with them, it wasn't enough. They cried and cried and accused God of not being a good God or a good provider. And as a result, they started to lust after other providers. And they started to say, life was so much better when we were back in slavery. All they wanted was what their hearts desired. They didn't want God they just wanted what they thought would make them happy. And so God judged the riffraff, those that craved the meat. He judged them, held them accountable, because he's like, you guys don't really want me anyway, so why do you need a life with me? You don't. But God spares the rest of Israel beyond the riffraff. See, this is a cautionary story for us because we are often not that different from the riffraff of Israel. How many times... Does our faithfulness to God hang in the balance of God giving us what we want or God giving us or doing for us the things that we think he should, that he should do for us? And when God does those things for us, the things go according to plan, man, God's such a good God. Can I get an amen? Can I get a praise? But when he doesn't do the things that we want or the things that we think that should happen, we start to question God and at times accuse him of not loving us the way that we think he ought to love us. When things are good, we're happy. We're willing to obey. We're willing to walk in faithfulness. Our worship is loud. It's full of life. But when things are not good or they don't go the way that we think they should go, we start to complain. And we start to be frustrated and we start to cry out. Now understand, remember this. God is okay with our tears God is okay with our cries he is okay when we're upset that does not frustrate or worry God 
He is okay when we come before him as people who are concerned, just like Moses, who come before him vulnerable, saying, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know how long I'm supposed to hold on for. How long is this going to go on for? Why do I have to keep facing this? Why do I feel like this? He is not intimidated by our questions. He is not intimidated by our fears or our worries or our longings. But... When our cries and our complaints start to grow to anger, and then when anger turns to bitterness and bitterness to resentment, and we start to forsake worship, we start to allow bitterness to take root, and we accuse God of not being a good God or a good provider, and that we're better at knowing what we need than God is at what, knowing what we need. We know better. God should just listen to me. That's where everything starts to crumble. That's where everything starts to fall apart. And by the way, in God's deep love for us, understand this, hear this. If we fight and complain long enough, God may allow exactly what we ask for to happen. And you might get to date or marry that person no matter what the red flags are. You might get that job or promotion no matter what it costs you. You might get to walk away from your faith and throw it all behind and say, you know what? Worth it. You might get that money. You might get that dream. You might get that desire, but at what cost? Because for Israel, for some of those in Israel, it cost them everything. And so for some of us, it may cost us everything. And for some of us, we're going to look back and we're going to say, wasn't worth it. God provides for us in his timing. And he provides for us according to his infinite knowledge. And sometimes when God says no, it's because we're not ready for a yes. Sometimes God says no because he's moving somewhere else in our lives that our eyes aren't looking or our eyes aren't considering. Sometimes God says no because he's preparing us for a completely different season or a completely different chapter. Sometimes God says no because the hardships that we're facing were not meant for us to run away from them, but we're meant to stick in them because by sticking in them, we, it, God is maturing us and leading us to places where we're going to have no other option but to trust him and to be patient. Just like Moses. And you know what? Sometimes God says yes for the very same reasons. But regardless of whether God says yes or no, our primary response should always be to trust God. To keep praying, to keep crying out to him. Our response should always be to worship God, to keep praising him and hoping in him, even when we're not sure how much longer, oh Lord, this is going to go on. Our response should always be to continue to follow God, to keep surrendering our lives to him. Don't run from God, continue to run to him. Even when everything inside of you is saying, no, just keep running away from him. I promise you that's not the voice of the Holy Spirit in your life. The Holy Spirit is going to always drive you to God, not away from him. Our response should be to wait on God, even when it's hard to see the why behind the what. I love what Tim Keller says about God answering our prayers and our desires. He says it like this. He says that when we pray and ask God for the desires of our heart, he'll either give us what we ask for, or give us what we would have asked for if we knew everything that he knows. Whether God says yes, whether God says no, understand this. He is always working in our lives for his glory, for our good, and the benefit of others. Always. What are the things right now that are in your life that you are craving after? And that you are chasing after right now, or perhaps no matter the cost. Now, you would never say, I'm chasing these, no matter the cost. But if you were to stop and look at the reality of your life, how much are you having to sacrifice to get the thing you're chasing? 
What happens if you actually get it? Does it repair the damage that's being done currently? Or do you end up getting it and you now are all alone? What are the things that you're chasing after? Because the things that you're chasing after, no matter the cost, and you're not going to stop, you're just going to keep going and keep going and keep going, what they really reveal are the desires of our heart. But without God, I promise you, it doesn't matter what you catch and what you hold on to, and you can grab 60 bushels of it and hold on to it forever. I promise you, without God, it's never going to satisfy you. It will run out, even 60 bushels worth. What are the things that you're going through right now where the only two options you have, and for some of you, you are at a crossroads right now, that you feel like you have two choices, that you can trust God, lean into him, and be patient, or you can accuse God and try to make your own way. Israel's example would tell us, let's keep trusting God, and let's keep leaning in, and let's be patient. Are you hurting right now? Are you frustrated? Do you want answers? Take those care of this. God will never be late to answer and lead you the places he wants you, ever. And God is never going to leave you. He's at the cent- he was at the center of the camp for Israel, and he's at the center of our lives today. If you've never put your faith and trust in Christ, before you can have that, before you can have any of these other things, the first step you need is to be able to say yes to Jesus. I'm a sinner. I'm running from God. I'm not running toward him but I want to live my life for him. I've tried after every desire of my heart. I've chased every dream. I've chased every whatever, and I'm still starving. I've had 60 bushels worth plus 60 bushels worth plus 60 bushels worth of all of my dreams, and I'm still starving. And I can't figure out, I'm X amount of years old, and I still don't know what the purpose of my life is. I don't know why things are falling apart. I don't know why things are perhaps even working out the way they are, but I don't know, but I need answers. And let me tell you something. Your answer is God. I promise you. And so if you would like to know more about what it is to have a relationship with Jesus, to put your faith and trust in Christ, I would love to have that conversation with you. Perhaps there's just some stuff going on and you'd like someone to pray with you and you're like, you know what, I'm not really sure what to do and I'm just tired of feeling tired, tired of feeling alone, I'm tired of feeling like I'm defeated. I promise you there's a God that cares about those things that are in your life and he wants you to take those things to him and say, God, here I am again. And I'm still tired and I'm still worn out and I still don't have answers and I still don't know what I'm supposed to do. But the one thing I do now know is that I'm going to keep trusting you. Sometimes it takes every bit of strength just to pray that and God honors that prayer. If you would stand with me. I'm going to be available over here by the piano if you'd like someone to pray with or talk with, whether it be about about a new life in Christ someone to pray with you just about life also be available in the lobby with my wife laura we'll both be over there if you need someone to talk with but let's pray right now god we just thank you so much for your goodness we thank you so much for loving us thank you for being a better provider than any of us could have ever imagined no things don't always go according to our agendas and our plans no things don't always go according to our desires or our whims but god thank you that you know better And that you care deeper for us than we even care for us. Thank you that you love us and provided for us everything we've ever needed before we even knew how to ask. Thank you, Lord, that we can find, that we can be satisfied in you. Help us to crave being satisfied in you more, more than anything the world has to offer and to to fill us up with, Lord. God, I pray that we would learn how to crave satisfaction in you. And if there's anyone here who's never put their faith and trust in you, no matter why they're running or how far they've run or where they're planning to run to, God, you are the God of of stopping people in their tracks and giving them a reason to turn and return back to you. And I pray this would be that moment. And so, God, we love you. We thank you. We pray these things in your name. Amen.
Amen. Well, listen, I have just a quick couple of uh, announcements for you. First of all, uh, happy Mother's Day to all the moms, and we hope and pray that you have an amazing day today. Don't forget, uh, for all the women that are present, grab a succulent on your way out. For those that won the drawing, the gift card is going to be at the table with the succulent. You can grab that. Because it's Mother's Day, there is no refuge or kids zone tonight. Kids and teens, hang out with mom, okay? Uh, also, there's no second hour uh, small groups, no second hour nursery. Uh, and so this is going to be the conclusion of uh, our Sunday morning right now so that everybody can go and celebrate and be with mom. Uh, also, uh, mark your calendars. June 2nd through the 8th, Serve Our City Week is back. We're, we have over 15 different projects that are going to be released by next Sunday online. You're welcome to go there. Uh, to our website. That's where you can find the project. Sign up. They're not released yet. They'll be released by Sunday. We'll also have the availability to sign up here uh, in person. But 2nd to the 8th, we'll have projects during the day, projects at night uh, that are just meant to love our neighbors, let them know that God loves them. We're going to have a fantastic week getting to serve together. Uh, also, the uh, next Sunday, we're going to close our service with a special time. We're going to have a time of baptism uh, next Sunday right after the service. Yeah. <laughs> And we're going to, weather permitting, we're going to go back outside and we're going to have an outdoor baptism again next week out on the lawn, out of the courtyard. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, the last announcement, we have a business meeting this Wednesday. Don't forget that for the members, uh, there are documents that are present. Uh, they're at the uh, Connection Center. We've also emailed them uh, for that meeting. And so let us close with the singing of doxology and then you are dismissed, Miss Serena.